through the uh, epistle of First John as we start as moving toward the latter parts of this last chapter. So tonight we're in chapter 5 of First John and we're going to pick up in verse 6, verse 6, and we're going to read down to 13. The Bible says, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And our gracious Heavenly Father, we again are thankful to you for the life that we have in your Son. We thank you, God, for your redemptive power. We thank you, God, for the plan of salvation. We thank you, God, for granting us all that we needed to believe. The grace, the mercy, the faith, God, the sacrificial death of Jesus. We thank you, God, for all these things. And we would just ask now, Lord, as we look to continue to be sanctified by the washing of the water of your word, that, God, your life that you've given to us, Lord, those seeds that would be planted by your word would continue to take root and grow. And that, Lord, our lives would, would show the development of that fruit. So, Father, help us now. God, may you be honored in all of this. Bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we come back to John here, and we have noted that we speak of all that John has, has when we speak about a summation, and, and John summarizes that for us when, in there in verse 13, and not that we're going to get into that this evening, but as we talk about the summation of, of this first epistle, and the reason for his writing, he says here, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. He writes to those who have believed. He's written to those, that they, the individuals who have believed, who are saved people, who are born again. That's who his audience directly is. And not saying that he didn't steer off at, at some given points to those that may be a part of the assembly who have never believed. But here he says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, the knowing. And as we have talked time and time again from this pulpit and elsewhere, that as we say that when people, you would ask them about, are you ready for heaven? Are you going to heaven? You know, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? And you've got people that say things like, as said, I hope so. I'm hoping I'm going to heaven. You know, maybe I'm going to get there. Those, those kind of thoughts. Well, that lacks, again, in the assurance of the believer because understanding that John is writing about the the, the salvation of which you and I have had wrought within us through that of the power of God, through his son Jesus Christ, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that you and I can know. We can know that we're saved. It's not a guessing game. It's not that we're adding up little bits and pieces here and I finally reach a, a sum total that's going to gain me this entrance in. But he is saying that you can know. And we do. If we're truly born again, God is our witness. God is our witness. He lets us understand and know that we do have eternal life. And with that, he says, and that you may continue. So not only the knowledge of that I am saved, that I am prepared for heaven, that God has worked that work in me, but also, as he says, and that may, you may continue to believe, that we continue to walk out 
our existence here in this world. And as we walk it out in faith in Jesus Christ, that our witness, our own witness, continues to go forward. That we may believe, that as we know that we have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe, not being bombarded as we are with an onslaught of worldly ways and worldly systems and false teaching and heresy and all the rest of it that can come at us from all different kinds of directions, that we continue, that we persevere. And part of that persevering is when we come back to the Word of God and we, we find out everything that God has for us set in His Word that we need to know, that we need to understand. And that in that, that is, we, we speak on those lines, that we, we, our, our faith, we should say, is, is increased. Our, our walk with God is, is closer. And that's the hope I'm, that for me as, as a pastor that any time I would get behind a pulpit like this or have the opportunity to speak or for any of us, I would think that we've been given a, time, a chance to witness that a witness of encouragement to somebody who is already a believer, that they would be encouraged in their walk in the Lord. And also for the lost people, that they too can be encouraged as the, the message kind of fell out this morning. That look, yes, we're all on the same level playing field. We've all sinned before God, but God has enough grace for you too. That God's grace is sufficient for you as well. So as John writes these things, he writes them that we can know that there's not this maybe so or thinking I do or yeah, I hope so one day. But he says that you know it's, it's instilled in you. If you're truly saved, it's something of which God has birthed in your life and that you know. And also just not the knowing of that we're saved, but we continue walking in that of our salvation. Working out, the Bible says, right? Working out our salvation with fear and trembling before God. Looking to honor God. Revere God in all that we say and all that we do. Now we get back to this first part where he says, this is he. Now, again, as John would argue throughout, and that's kind of the summation of it all there in verse 13, but John's argument throughout is that Jesus is the Christ. He, he makes that clear. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. That's one thing that he wants to make sure that everybody, by the time this letter is read and gone through, that people understand Jesus is the Christ. And not only that Jesus is the Christ, but Jesus has come into the world, that the Messiah has arrived. The Jews were expecting the Messiah to come, and Jesus, as is, is John would say, that the Messiah has arrived. He has. He has come into the world. And not as some, because remember we talked about, I don't know, months ago, probably by now, we talked about how John not only was encouraging believers in what he was writing here, but he also had to combat heresy. He also was combating the, the early stages of what we would know today as Gnosticism. That, that battle between good and evil. This idea that, that Christ, the, the Jesus of which we know, that he was, he was uh, that the spiritual part of him was good, but the physical part of him was evil. This, this idea of what they were presenting. And John was combating that. It was starting to have, take some root, and John had for those early believers to combat that for them. So we speak about Jesus coming into the world. That is exactly what he did. He came into the world. He did not come into existence. And there is a difference. He just did not come into existence in that moment in a manger back when we read in Matthew and Luke there in those first couple chapters for them that all of a sudden that this Jesus come into existence. Because remember, just as the Bible teaches us, that Jesus has always existed. The Christ has always existed. And that's one thing that we see John over and over again saying, come into the world, come into the world. The Christ is coming to the world. Jesus is coming to the world. It does not say that Jesus come into existence in the world. He already existed. He was already there. And the phrases of which John uses that he wants us to be clear on that because again, he was combating that heresy. He had to make sure that people understood that this Jesus of which we know has always been and he always will be. 
And not only that, when we talk about John's argument that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that Jesus has always existed, and that this Jesus coming to the world, his call continually is for people to believe. Believe in Jesus. And that's what we see. That little 13th verse there is kind of the summation of it all. Believing, trusting, putting your hope in the person of Jesus Christ, knowing that Christ alone is the only way unto salvation, that this is the Messiah the Jews long for, and this is the hope that God had foretold that the Gentiles could have as well. That yes, the chosen people had the Messiah, but also through the Messiah, the Gentiles would have hope as well. And I think that encompasses everybody in here, I believe. I don't know if we've got any uh, Jewish background within us tonight. But we have the hope. We have the hope because of all that Christ has done. And then in verse 6, it says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. This is he. This is him. This is the one who came by water and blood, not only by water, but by, by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. And that's where I want to springboard tonight. I want to just take a, a little bit of time here this evening to speak about the witness that John is referring to here. John says that this is he who came by water and blood. Now, as we read through, through many commentaries and look and say, well, what does this mean? Because that, it's, it's certainly something of which we have to address. This is he who came by water and blood. And what is this the symbolism of which he's referring to? What is this witness? Because he speaks about this is the witness of Jesus Christ. The water, the blood, and the spirit. These three witness, they testify of him. So, as you would read and maybe on your own or look up things and try to understand what's going on here, there are many different ones that are out there that saying, well, it could be this or it could be that or maybe it's this. But we have to stop and we have to really see where John, from his perspective, what he's looking at and comparing Scripture to Scripture. What do we mean by this? Well, the one thing that we, are, we can be assured of that it's not is when it is referred that some would go back and say, well, it is referring to when Jesus' side was pierced when he was on the cross confirming his death. Because remember, when his side was pierced, the Roman soldier, Pilate couldn't believe he was already dead. They sent back, sent back to make sure they were dead. They were going to break their knees. Christ had already died. He'd given up the ghost. And the centurion took the spear, put it into his side, and the Bible says that water and blood run out. Water and blood run out. Well, it certainly is the witness that he, he had died, he, that he was dead, but it's not the witness of which John himself was speaking of. Also, there are those that would refer to this idea of water and blood as being that of the what would be considered back when we would call them the ordinances. Uh, some would call them sacraments. When we look at Luther, Martin Luther, John Calvin, others as reformers, they, because of their background, because remember when they were coming, when the Reformation was, was inflamed, when it was happening in the coming of the Protestant church, uh, that they were coming out of the Catholic tradition. And there was a lot of emphasis put on sacraments. More so, as we would come to find out, a whole lot more than the Word of God, a whole lot more than the person of Jesus Christ himself. So with them, they would, they would feel that this whole water and blood thing is referring to the sacraments of the church, meaning, first, water, which is symbolic of baptism. They would feel, oh, this is the witness. This is the witness of Christ, baptism. Well, when we speak about the ordinance of the church, the witness of the church, the baptism and the Lord's Supper, which we would see as the blood, uh, those are things for the believer. It is a witness for us that we are saved, but it's not what John is referring to here because he is looking at something that has taken place and witnesses to the person of Jesus Christ specifically. Not our faith, not our belief in him, but the witness of him. 
So we are probably tonight, and, and I, would, I would believe that we are, it's best viewed here, not of which is the piercing of Jesus' side, which is pretty erroneous, and not taking it from that of the, of the reformers, those early reformers coming out of that tradition, but understanding that it was best viewed that we speak about the witness of Jesus Christ, because that's what it is, as he says, that he who came, he came by water and blood, Christ Jesus, not only by water, uh, but by in the blood and the spirit also bears witness to this truth. Verse eight, he says, these three bear witness on the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree as one. These are the witnesses. We would probably be best to agree and look at it when we speak of the life of Jesus Christ and what John is referring to. The first dealing with the water. When Jesus first come on the scene, and, and certainly as we read in the first chapter of Mark, we know that in the first chapter of Mark, and then later in the other Gospels, that we see John the Baptist is baptizing out in the, the wilderness. He's down on the Jordan River, and he's baptizing individuals. Jesus, at that particular point, would make the public declaration. He, that would be the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ there. He would come and identify at that moment, when he would come down to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, him being sinless. Because remember, John's baptism was a, a baptism for the remission of sins. Jesus Christ need not a baptism for the remission of his sins. But what he did at that moment was fulfill all righteousness and he identified with the sinners in the world. Not that he was a sinner, but he identified at that moment. Identifying with the sinners, identifying with sin, and then ultimately we understand that he would take the sin, all the sin of the world upon himself. So when we look at the witness, the testimony of Jesus Christ, it is there at that particular time, and if you would, Look at uh, John, go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, looking at verses uh, 32, and we'll read just a few verses here. And it says, John chapter 1, verse 32, and it says, And John bore witness, meaning John the Baptist bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained upon him, meaning the person of Jesus Christ. It remained upon him. He says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And he says, and I have seen and testified that this is what? the Son of God. There at that moment, there was a witness that was given, just not by man being John himself, the Baptist, but we also see the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his identification with sin, and his identification with sin, with sinners, that God himself witnesses from heaven at the moment of baptism by saying, what? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The witness, this witness of his baptism, that moment, the beginning of his ministry there. And many people saw it And John being, as we speak along the lines, John the Baptist being one among many, many others that were there. Because then we have these disciples that go off and tell of Jesus Christ. Not only that, but you can read, as just as a reference when we look at Matthew chapter 3, it gives us more detail into the baptism of Jesus Christ more than John does. In John chapter 3, looking at verse 17, and where it says, And suddenly a voice came up from heaven, saying, After the dove had descended upon him, And this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is him. God of heaven spoke, This is my Son. This is him. And later on, we would see that at the, at the time of Jesus at the time of Jesus' transfiguration, that we hear these same words again, along with hear him or listen to him. So when we look at the, the water and the blood, 
we would we we were best to take it just as these bearing witness to this person of Jesus Christ, his identification with sin, him coming into the world. Secondly, we look at not only is it by the water that he initially coming into the world, because keep in mind that John also has in his mind as he's fighting the beginnings of Gnosticism that what the early individuals were saying in Gnosticism, a heresy, would say it was at that moment that Jesus became the Christ. And that is not so. Because Jesus has always been the Christ. He has always been the Son of God. They had that dualism idea that flesh was wicked and spirit, all spirit was good and Again, Jesus, Jesus has always been. Jesus has always been. But those individuals will say it was be at that moment when the Spirit descended upon him is when he become the Christ. It's not so. Jesus, before he stepped down in the waters, were the Christ. But not only with that, when we speak along these lines, but it says the water and the blood. And these three agree. These three, three things agree. The water, the blood, and the spirit. These things agree. So we now we jump from this water to the baptism, and then we go through all of Christ's ministry. And then at the very end, when we speak about the uh, basically the earthly ministry of Christ, we see the death of Christ. We see Christ dying on the cross. And that would certainly lead us to look at the witness of the blood of Jesus Christ. The testimony that it leaves behind today for us. Matthew chapter 27, if you would turn with me there. I'd like to read a few verses. Matthew 27, looking at verse 45. Matthew 27, verse 45. The Bible says, in the death of Christ. He has died. Now the sixth hour, it says, verse 45 of chapter 27 of Matthew. He says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. It just doesn't happen. It's not a natural occurrence, even if it was, as some would like to say, oh, it was an eclipse. An eclipse doesn't last three hours. But here we see there was darkness from that particular time, ninth, sixth hour until the ninth hour, and then at the ninth hour, another, a testimony, the witness of God, that this was God's son. Darkness covered the face of the earth then. And it said, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatathan, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus cries out, referring back to that of uh, a piece of which would be scripture before. And some of those who stood there, they heard it and said, the man is calling for Elijah. So Jesus himself, my God, my God, you have forsaken me. This darkness of this hour and, and sensing that is, is the punishment, the wrath of God being poured out upon his son, Jesus Christ, taking our wrath upon himself. Jesus Christ giving his life for us. See, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And then it says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And at that moment that we see when Jesus Christ yielded up his spirit, that Christ gave up his life. Because remember, he said that no one would take it from me. But I would lay it down freely. I will give my life freely. And it says when Jesus himself yielded up his spirit, he cried out with that loud voice. And at that moment when that happened, the Bible says, Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split. The testimony of the Son of God, the death of the Son of God there is the veil was rent from top to bottom. As all of us as good Bible students, we understand that that just speaks about no longer is there a veil of separation between God and man. We do not need as a human being as the, the intermediary. We do not need one to intercede for us humanly, but now we have the divine Son of God who is our intercessor. He is the one who goes before us. He is the one who split the veil for you and I that now we have direct access 
to God. Amen. The witness, the witness of him is the blood of Jesus Christ being poured out on the ground and God himself tearing the veil away. And the earth itself, the Bible says, trembled. The rocks split. And not only did the rock split it, but as we read a little further, it tells us in verse 52, as these rocks were split, and it says, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who fall, had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. The power of God, the witness to the greatness of God, the goodness of God, and how God's power through his son, Jesus Christ, making a way for all who would believe into the presence of God, and not only that, but that of eternal life, granting the resurrection from the dead. And these people would eventually die again, but we know that the, the, the next resurrection of which we all have, we will never die again. And that is what the promise of which we have from Jesus Christ. And they appeared to many, the Bible says. And then in 54, verse 54, you have a battle-hardened centurion who had probably seen more than you and I would ever want or dare to see. And this man standing there at the feet of Jesus Christ, he says this. So when the centurion and those with him who were standing guard, who were, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they feared greatly, saying, this was the Son of God. The witness, the power of God at Jesus' death witnessed even for somebody who was a heathen. Truly this was, surely this was the Son of God. God's witness to his Son, Jesus Christ. The psalmist, if you jump back there, and we'll, we'll begin to bring this to a close. The psalmist, I've been in psalms a lot today, so I might as well just wrap it. Well, we're not going to wrap it up here, but we'll be getting close. Psalm 22 uh, the Bible tells us in verses 7 and 8, not only do we have the historical Jesus and the things that went on with Jesus Christ there at the cross, but also God had testified, had witnessed centuries before about what would go on with his Messiah, with his Son. Verse 7 and 8 of Psalm 22, he says, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. That's what we see almost verbatim of which we see going on around the cross that day. If God saved him, let, if he is the Messiah, if he is the son of God, let him take himself off that cross. But that was never God's plan. His plan was to shed his blood that day. Also, if you jump down a few more verses in verse 14, he says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue clings to my jaws for they have brought me to the dust of the earth. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look at me and stare, and they divide my garments among them and my clothing. For my clothing they cast lots. The witness of God. God's testimony about the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And John himself, the, the writer, the apostle, we go back to where we were. Certainly he, he was very well aware of these things. John was there the day Jesus died. He stood there. He stood there with all the women. And Jesus would give him a commission to take his mother. Behold, woman. Behold, this is your son. Man, behold, this is your mother. This is him. You take him. And John would take his mother Mary into her house, apparently until her death. So we have these three the, of God's witness to all humanity by the water, that of Jesus being acknowledged at that moment as the one, as John would say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John had been given beforehand, prophesied that this one who the dove would come upon, this will be he whom I have testified to, this will be the Christ, this will be the one. And then we see just as Jesus himself was crucified that day on our behalf the blood that was poured out we see that that's all a part of our our liturgy today when we we understand and see that in, in remembrance of jesus christ it's all the witness to him 
And lastly, the third witness of which we see here is that of the Spirit. The Spirit of God. It testifies of Jesus Christ. That literal figure in history. Just not of which we know about Jesus, but because that's what I wanted to focus on this evening. We talk about the witness. That of his, certainly his baptism, the water, that of his death, his blood. And the Spirit that gave witness to many during that of the birth and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see the Spirit of God's activity all throughout the person of Jesus Christ. That moment he was conceived, remember that's part of the Apostles' Creed, he was conceived by what? The Holy Spirit. He was conceived by him. God himself would conceive that it wouldn't be a, the, a copulation of two individual human beings, but God himself by that of his Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit. We see, as we've already noted, at the baptism of Jesus, because we had those unseen years, with the exception of one time when Jesus was 12. But then we had when Jesus would come onto the scene to begin his three and a half years of ministry there at his baptism, when God would testify from heaven, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. And we see the Spirit of God, we see the Spirit of God descending and settling upon him in the shape of a dove. And not only that, but then just not very long after his baptism, the Bible tells us that he was driven into the, into the wilderness by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. That there we see how the Spirit would be a, a player in the life of Jesus Christ throughout. Because remember, Jesus Christ surrendered that of divinity to become like you and I. And the Spirit of God would be a part of his entire career, as we, if we want to use the term, as he would minister to the people here. And then looking at his earthly ministry. Looking at the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ and the working of the Spirit of God. Working, looking at the witness of the Spirit of God as a testimony to who Jesus Christ is. The Bible tells us in a few places, if you turn with me, and we are closing up. Acts chapter 10, if you would. Acts chapter 10, a, a very clear word that we have here in this 10th chapter when it speaks about the ministry, the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' life. Peter is preaching here to Cornelius, to his household, this this Roman centurion, and he says this in verse 38. He says, And how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Spirit's testimony in Jesus' life. And Peter using this, this is, what, this is a God thing. This is just not a man thing. This is not something Cornelius of which we have made up, but the Spirit of God was upon him and anointed him for the work of the ministry. Mark chapter 3, if you go back to the gospel, we see here as it's testified of Jesus Christ in chapter 28, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 28. He says, speaking of the ministry, Jesus himself speaking of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He says, Assuredly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemy they utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he had an unclean spirit. Because see, the spirit was within Jesus Christ. It was how he accomplished what he accomplished. It was the anointing of the spirit of God given him. It was the spirit's testimony and witness to working through the son of God. And they would say, well, he cast out demons because he has a demon. And Jesus was clear to say, oh, all sins will be forgiven. You can do all sins will be forgiven, but when you blaspheme against the working of the Holy Spirit, when you say that I have a demon, and what really is working in me is the Spirit of God, you blaspheme God. And that, as he notes here, it will never have forgiveness, but he is subject to that of condemnation eternal is what the word there is king james i believe would render it eternal damnation the spirit's testimony the spirit's witness throughout jesus life these three agree and john was saying we have all these witnesses and many more we have all of this to witness to the person of jesus christ that he is the son of god and how does that work for us today when we look and we, we have the knowledge of the historical Jesus Christ 
We see all these things that uh, a well-preserved book, one of the most well-preserved ancient documents of which mankind has ever had is this book. And with that, what we see is the Spirit of God still testifying to you and I today. The Spirit of God still testifies. And we can look back and we can read and we can see and learn about the historical Jesus and all that he did on our behalf. But it is still the witness of the Spirit of God in your life and in my life today that continues to testify to Jesus Christ. These things we read through the Word of God, they testify to us, Jesus' baptism, His death, His resurrection. But it's the Spirit of God that testifies to you and I. It's the Spirit of God that opens our eyes to these truths. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 at verse 3, it, it is there where the Bible teaches us that it's the Spirit of God who illuminates our eyes and opens our eyes to see these things for actually what they are. Maybe at one time we took the Bible as just another book, another good book. It's got a lot of good lessons in it, a lot of good things we can learn from it. But until the Spirit of God opened our eyes to see the spiritual truths that rest within, that's probably all it was, was just another book. But God, through the ministry of His Spirit, He opens our eyes. And then we would see in 1 John, as we had already read uh, in 1 John, looking at chapter 3, not only does the Spirit open our eyes to see these valuable truths, but also in chapter 3, He says this in verse 24. He says, Now he who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. The empowerment of the Spirit of God. When we come to believe, the Spirit opens our eyes to believe. And when we come to believe, He empowers us and enables us to live out a life that is pleasing to the Lord. To be sanctified in Him. And not only that, but there's a Spirit and He opens our eyes. He empowers us. And lastly, as John would say in the 4th chapter and 13th verse, He says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. See, these things we know. We know this because of what the Spirit of God does and that you and I, not only are eyes open for the, for a, that we can see the truth of God's Word, He empowers you to live a faithful life of obedience and also with that, that we have communion with the Lord. Just as we can have right now in our, our quiet times, our closets when we get together, that we can commune with God. Why is that? Because the Spirit dwells within us and we can be alone with the Lord. We can be quiet with Him. And He testifies to us again, over and over again, with the working of His Word and the Spirit that dwells within, that we're His. That we're His. And what a wonderful witness. The next week we'll talk about the witness of man because John himself, he says, you know, we have the witness of men, but guess what? The witness of God is greater. It's greater. And certainly we want to be as men, as human beings, the ones who love the Lord, a faithful witness. Always remember, it's like we, we emphasize, we want that testimony. We want people, I want all of you to have a good testimony. I want all of you to have a good witness in Jesus Christ. But when those people around us may fail sometimes, as I said this morning, we have a greater witness. And that's Jesus Christ himself. John said it's the water and the blood and that of the, of the Spirit. And he said these things, they all agree. They agree. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just praise your holy name. We thank you, God, for the testimony, the witness of your Spirit in our lives. We thank you, God, that you've open our eyes to, to so many things and that God we can rest in you that God we can be assured in you that God we as we sing that old song blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a fuller taste of glory divine God we're just tasting now Lord the great things that you have prepared for us Lord help us all tonight everybody that's in here help us God to be faithful to you help us Lord to just to allow those things of which we've spoken about tonight just to take a root in our souls and encourage us and, and Lord, be able to, to minister to others knowing, God, that you are the greatest witness of all. Father, I pray you bless this congregation this evening, Lord. Continue to use them and work in them. 
And God, sanctify them uh, and then set them apart, God, for, for a work that only you can do through them. And help me, Lord, as they're under shepherd, God, knowing that looking to the great shepherd, help me, Lord, to be faithful to, to, to minister from this pulpit and elsewhere, God, to the truths, Lord, that rest within. And God, again, may in all of our efforts, everything that God were able to do as a church collectively and individually, Lord, may it all be to your glory and honor and praise. So thank you again, Father, for granting us this evening. Thank you, God, for this day. And thank you, Lord, for the fellowship and the communion that we have with one another. And most important, Lord, the fellowship and communion we have with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you all for giving me a, a little, 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 little bit of liberty and getting it out of me. Uh, so I uh, appreciate it and uh, for hanging in here and not, uh, not falling asleep on me. So uh, or headed out. But you all take care. You have a good evening. And I uh, look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we're going right into the Exodus. We'll be we, Tuesday night, I mean. Tuesday night, Exodus. Moving out from the Passover, heading on into the, the Exodus. And thank you all for joining us on Facebook this evening.